Good morning. You know, uh, not too long ago, Jeremy and myself and even uh, Stacy went up uh, to my uh, dad, my parents' place, and helped them put together a uh, steel shed. And this wound up becoming a multi-day project, and I learned it's important to wear leather, leather gloves when you're dealing with uh, sheet metal. I cut my <laughs> the same finger twice. After it healed, I cut it again. Uh, you'd think you'd learn. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, difficult as that was, with all the itty bitty teeny little screws, you know what the most important part, the most important part of uh, this project was and putting it together? No, it wasn't the power tools, which did make it go faster. Um, it, it, it was the uh, instruction booklet. And I was going to ask, you know, uh, instruction booklet. The guys, this does look kind of familiar, right? Uh, you know, how many of you, when you open up a box, take this out and set it to the side and just go to work, right? Yeah, so, oh, it's not just a guy thing, is it then? Okay. <laughs> oh, and I was thinking about that. You know, um, who was it that uh, put this together? It was a guy or probably a team of people that designed whatever it is that you're working with. And they know something more about this item than I do. And I was thinking about uh, life itself. Isn't there a designer of all of life? And haven't we also been given an instruction manual uh, for, for life? And um, that comes from God. In fact, uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 8, it deals with the creation and wisdom speaks in Proverbs chapter 8. And she says that she was there at the very beginning when God designed the world and everything in it, that she was the engineer, that she was the architect of all of creation. And so how the, the rain comes down and waters the earth and cause it, causes uh, things to grow, wisdom says, I designed that. Or how gravity works and the sun goes around, or not the sun, the earth goes around the sun and gives us all of the seasons with, uh, with its gravity and uh, earth axis and all that. Wisdom says, I designed all of that. Or uh, electricity, or, and, and the list just goes on and on and on. And we keep discovering more things that wisdom was involved in in the design of the world. And wisdom concludes with this. She says, and now, O sons, listen to me. Hear instruction. Listen to instruction and be wise. And she says, blessed, and here is her beatitude. Blessed is the one who listens to me. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. And wisdom has given many instructions concerning life. And when we honor the instructions, uh, things have a tendency to go uh, better. Um, and uh, we learn about design limitations. You know what design limitations are, right? Uh, this made me think about this. I used to, once upon a time, and those of you from Plasma probably remember, uh, once upon a time, I used to drive around, if I remember right, it was 1974 Gremlin. And it was not just a Gremlin, it was a Gremlin X. And I was really proud of that X because it had sport wheels and bucket seats and a sport steering wheel. Never mind that the, the side view mirror was hanging out the door and it had a blue primer door that didn't work very well on the other side. And my friend, I'd go visit him. He was always coming out in the yard when I pulled up and he said, how do you know that I'm coming? I said, I can hear you from two blocks away. Uh, but you know what? Even though it had the sports package, it was still a six cylinder and it wasn't very fast. Well, you know, when I eat sweets, when I eat things loaded with sugar, it peps me up and gives me energy. So how about I take some of that and put it into the gas tank? Wouldn't that pep up my car? No, it wouldn't run anymore, right? It would ruin it. That is a design limitation. That gasoline engine was designed to run on gasoline and nothing else. 
And we have design limitations here with all of life as well. And so wisdom teaches us that, yes, there is a physical design to all of things. We don't step off of the edge of a cliff because gravity will pull us down real fast. That is the design limitation. There are design limitations when it comes to relationships, when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to a family. And when we honor the design, things have a tendency to go well. And wisdom gives us this instruction. You know what the beginning of wisdom is? I, th- I may have asked this uh, question enough time to maybe it's not a trick question anymore. The beginning of wisdom is what? Let me hear it. The fear of God. It does say at the, in Proverbs chapter 9, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But in chapter 4, <laughs> wisdom says this. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Now that seems kind of like, well, duh, right? Uh, It seems overly simplistic, but the wisdom in this is in its simplicity. You know what this tells me when I look at this passage? It tells me that wisdom is not something that happens automatically. It tells me that wisdom doesn't automatically come with age. We kind of have this mindset that the older I get, the wiser I'm supposed to get. But this reminds us that it doesn't just happen automatically. You may know someone in your life that is uh, aged and has uh, gray hair that may be the most unwise person that you know. Which demonstrates that wisdom doesn't automatically come with age. And you may know a young person that is sometimes the wisest person in the room, even surrounded by older people. And that demonstrates this principle that wisdom doesn't just come automatically. Wisdom is something that we must pursue and inquire. And that's part of the message we're going to be looking at this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So take your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to go ahead and continue with our series this morning uh, in uh, chapter 2. And uh, Paul has already been dealing with uh, wisdom. In fact, the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians deals with wisdom. And one of the things that he's going to say in the next chapter is that if any of you, if anyone, any of you think you are wise in this age then you must become a fool in order to become wise. And that may seem strange, but one of the things he's contrasting is the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. Remember he said the wisdom or the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. And part of the problem with the Corinthian church is that they were still operating out of worldly wisdom rather than according to the wisdom of God. And so the message we're going to be looking at this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is this. We must pursue godly wisdom and not worldly wisdom. And what we see in the text here is in order to do that, we need to rest our faith on the simple gospel rather than on the wisdom of men. So let's go ahead and read. First verse. When I, and I, when I came to you, brothers did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see what Paul's doing? He intentionally avoided sounding like the educated, intentionally avoided sounding like the philosophers and the teachers and the scholars and the smart people of his day. And said, he said, I determined to know nothing among you. I got rid of all this other stuff. And by the way, all of that was at his disposal. Here was a man that had an advanced education and an advanced degree and all of these tools at his disposal, but he chose not to use them. And instead he says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, which means he probably didn't quote a whole lot of philosophers. 
He probably didn't refer to the poets or the authority figures of his day. If he had, he probably would have come across as very educated and very well-spoken, well-read and smart. But he chose to do none of those things. Just Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that may seem unwise. That may seem inefficient. You remember what he said in the last chapter? The message of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews, a scandal to the Jews, and foolishness to the Greeks. In fact, I don't know if that, that, that phrase probably doesn't strike us the same way it would have people in those days, a message of the cross. Do you realize the word cross was one of those words that was not spoken in proper and polite company. It was stauros in Greek and crux in Latin. In proper company, you did not, it was almost like being a bad word or a cuss word or something you just did not say. And our message, my message, Paul said, was our Lord was crucified on a cross. Insert the gasp right here. Oh, and I think we see the attitude people had toward that message among the Greeks in this ancient piece of graffiti that was found from the second century. I don't know if you can see it very well. I went back over it with a uh, dark pen and tried to highlight it so you can see what's on here. <coughs> and that um, inscription there says, Aleximenos worships God. And you see what the man is looking at? A donkey on a cross. And that's the way people viewed <coughs> the message of the cross. And that's the way people viewed Christians. So, if this was the reception among the elite and the educated, <coughs> then why not dress it up? Why not tweak it? Why not make it more acceptable to their sensibilities so that they would be open to hearing the message of the cross. <clears throat> Paul intentionally said in the last chapter, I avoided doing all of that, lest the cross of Christ should be made devoid of its power. To do so, to dress it up in human wisdom and philosophy would have taken away the power of the cross. So he avoided these eloquent words of wisdom. He avoided sounding like the scholars on PBS. He avoided sounding like Oprah or the talk show host. He didn't dress up the cross in worldly wisdom. And the result, he says, is a message of the cross. Yes, it is foolishness to the world. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. They're too enlightened for that. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Why is that? Well, think about it. What is the solution to all of our ills in this world? There's only one solution, and it's Jesus Christ on the cross, as Jesus Christ risen up from the dead. We know that the root of our problem stems from one three little word, right? We see that all the way back at the beginning of Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned and sin came into the world, we see in the cha uh, chapters that follow that the world spiraled downward. Regardless of the fact that uh, Cain's descendants are building cities and learning uh, about uh, uh, of how to uh, uh, do uh, metalwork and learning uh, art and music and literature, in spite of all of that violence and sin and wickedness increased to the point where it says that mankind's thoughts were on wicked and evil constantly to the point where God was grieved that he had created man on the earth. And you know what? That means that we... Human beings have exceeded our design limitations. We have sinned and we have gunked things up. We have made a mess of things. And as many times as we have tried to fix our own problems, nothing ever seems to be fully effective. Have you ever noticed that? Jesus says the person who sins becomes a slave to sin. And if I'm enslaved to sin, then there's no way I'm going to be able to work myself out of it. The only hope for me is for someone to rescue me from my slavery to sin. Every attempt to fix the problems of humanity, whether it's been through Marxism, communism, some sort of political activism, or some other ism, 
has always ended up not fixing the problem and in some cases even making the problems worse. And the, and the reason is because the only way our problems can be fixed is if you deal with the root of the problem. And we know the root of the problem is not the system. The root of the problem lies in the human heart which has been tainted and affected by sin. And the only solution is a complete overhaul, a rebuild of the human heart which has been gunked up by exceeding design limitations. And only Jesus can overhaul our heart. That's what his goal was when he went to the cross to die for the sin which gunked up our heart. That's what his goal was when he rose up from the grave and he sent to us the helper, the spirit, to transform us back into the glory and the image and the beauty of God that he created us with at the very beginning. No wonder the cross is the wisdom and the power of God. Second point is this. We need to recognize that wisdom is revealed to us by God. It goes on, it says in verse 6, Yet, yet among the mature we, Im, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared, what God has prepared, God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those, to those who, are, who are spiritual. You know what this says? Without God, full, true, heavenly Godly wisdom is inaccessible. It's inaccessible regardless of age, regardless of experience. In fact, I'm not going to read it this morning because it's quite lengthy, but if you go back to Romans chapter 1, it highlights what happens when you engage in the pursuit of wisdom apart from God. It tells us how God has made himself known through everything that, that has been made so that people are without excuse. But instead of acknowledging God, instead of giving God thanks, they pursue their own wisdom apart from God. And claiming to be wise, it says they became fools and exchanged something else and put something else in the place of God whether it's a statue or whether it's our own human endeavor and we make an idol out of ourselves. And uh, professing to be wise, they became fools and the rest of the chapter highlights the moral and social degradation that came as a result of that. Oh, wisdom is inaccessible without walking with God. Where does wisdom come from? Um... It says here in this passage, we just read, that God reveals it to us through the Spirit. And that's why I underline that word. Wisdom is revealed to us by God. In other words, we can't go out and get it all on our own. The wisdom we receive, the wisdom we gain, is revealed to us by God. And I think the psalmist understood this. Look at this prayer from the psalmist in the 119th Psalm. Psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, 
For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. In fact, that entire, you know, that's the longest psalm, the longest, I don't know if you call it a chapter, uh, in the entire Bible. And the theme of that entire psalm is the word of God. And what the psalmist is saying here is, it is my wisdom. It is my passion. It is my meditation. And, and I was, as I was uh, reflecting on this, I noticed all the different words that he uses for God's word. He refers to it as law. Now, I don't know if you realize that the word law in Hebrew has a different ring to it than it does for us today. When you hear the word law, I know probably what most of us think. We usually think of a courtroom, right? We usually think of lawyers. We think of a law library with all of these dusty books and all of these uh, laws and obscure court cases. And there is that aspect to God's law. But I don't know if you realize the word law in Hebrew can also be translated instruction. In fact, there is a verb form for the Hebrew word law, Torah, which is yara, and it means to instruct or to teach. And so when God is giving his law, he's not just giving a bare set of uh, statutes, civil statutes. He's giving us instruction on how he wants us to be. He instructs us. And notice uh, the, this uh, psalm also calls it uh, his commandments. God gives us his commandments. It also calls, him, uh, calls it his testimonies and his precepts. And as I'm going through all these different words, and there's many more in the scriptures uh, it dawned on me as I was thinking about this that um, the uh, analogy of God's Word being an instruction booklet falls short of what God's Word is because it's much more than simply an instruction booklet. And I was trying to think of some other analogy and everything I thought of always spells short of what this actually is because the Bible says that God's Word is God-breathed. There is no other document in existence where it can be said that it is God-breathed. It is in a class all of its own. That's why uh, we print a holy Bible on here. You know what the word holy Bible means, the phrase means, right? Bible means book, holy means different. This is different than any other document in existence. So no one word captures every aspect of God's word. It's in a class all its own, and that's why... The Bible says this, like newborn babies, you know, this will be one of the few passages in the Bible that tells you to be babies <laughs> or to be like babies. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Now, what does it mean when it tells us to be like newborn babies? Those of us that have raised newborns know what this is talking about, right? When you think of a newborn baby, what do you normally think of? What sound do you normally think of, right? Newborn baby comes into the world and the first sound they make is what? Wow, wow, right? And that's a sound you better get used to. <laughs> Because you come home and uh, it seems like every time you turn around, you hear that sound again. And, and it usually means one of two things, right? Well, actually, it could probably mean three things. E either I, I don't feel good or I'm sick or I need to be changed or I'm hungry. And so if, he's, if the baby's crying because he's hungry, and what if you don't have anything and you say, Hey, look at this little toy. Isn't it neat? Isn't it cute? What does the baby do? He cries louder. No, I don't want that. I want one thing, and I want one thing only. And this passage is saying, be like that when it comes to God's word. Nothing else will do. My passion, my meditation is God's word. And when I intake God's word, then it says, I will grow in respect to salvation. That's what my appetite must be like. And when I do that, I will grow in godly wisdom. And that brings us to the last point. Recognize that God's wisdom is accessible only to the spiritual. Let's go ahead and read the last uh, paragraph here. Verse 14. The natural person, and your Bible may say the unspiritual person, means the same thing. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 
The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This patch is a saying that if I am not spiritual, then God's wisdom will be nonsense to me. It'll be foolishness. It'll be folly. And it doesn't matter whether I'm a guru. It doesn't matter whether people call me a sage. It doesn't matter whether I am a professor or a scientist or a journalist or a politician or an Oprah groupie or whatever it is. It will be foolish to me if I am not a spiritual person. It says that the natural person, the unspiritual person, rejects the wisdom of God. And so that raises this question, what does it mean to be spiritual? Now, people throw that word around, right? You hear that a lot. Matter of fact, oftentimes you hear it uh, uh, said in contrast with being religious, right? I am not a religious person, but I am spiritual. Well, what does that mean? Maybe the better question is not what do you mean by that, but what does the Bible mean by being a spiritual person? Let's go back and look at this again. Here's what it says and what we just read. Who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And so this reminds us that being spiritual is knowing God's thoughts, knowing what God loves, knowing God's will, knowing what God hates. That's part of what it means to be spiritual. And then it also said this in the next verse, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are, who are spiritual. And remember, remember when we were looking at spiritual warfare? You remember what the sword of the Spirit is? Put on, uh, take up the helmet of salvation, and you probably can't see it back here, but the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. The spirit, the, this, is, this is the Spirit's tool in order to work in our lives. And so uh, we're talking about words that come from God. It is being able to understand spiritual truths according to God's word and not the wisdom of the world. And then we also have this. It goes on and says, A natural person or the unspiritual person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person, there's that word, spiritual. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so this reminds us that being spiritual enables us to understand God's will as wisdom and understand the world's wisdom for the folly that it is. And it enables us, enables us to apply godly wisdom in our life and avoid using worldly wisdom. So being spiritual simply means this. It means to walk in harmony with God in his wisdom according to his word. That's what it means to be spiritual according to what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, this reminds me the fact that God's word or God's wisdom is accessible only to the spiritual. It reminds me of the time that I twisted my ankle really bad. We used to have a, a lab. Some of you have met our lab, the lab that we used to have. Uh, he used to like to dig holes in the backyard. And I remember I was running across the backyard and I put my foot in one of those holes and fell over and I actually heard crack. And I thought I broke my ankle and went into the doctor. There was a nice little purple ring all the way around my ankle. Found out I didn't break it, I sprained it. And the doctor said it might have been better if I had broken it because it probably would have healed faster than that sprain. And it took me about a year before that ankle began to feel normal again. But for a while, I could not walk on it. I had crutches, I had a boot on it. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that the wisdom for the unspiritual, the unwise, uh, the person that doesn't walk with God is like that useless leg. Proverbs chapter 26 says, like a lame man's legs, which hangs useless, 
is a proverb in the mouth of fools. In other words, he may have a proverb with all of God's wisdom and the promise that it holds, but it's useless to him. He doesn't know what to do with it. In fact, it may even be foolishness to him. Oh, and then there's this one. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is... A, I forgot to put the second half of that. Uh, is, the, uh, um, uh, is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard. Not thought about that. The thorn in the hand of a drunkard. If you have a thorn, what's going to wind up happening to your hand? You're going to get it hurt. Now, you probably wonder why I got a picture of Bruce Lee with his nunchucks up there. But that made me think of, you, you ever seen those Bruce Lee movies where he drops his nunchucks and his opponent picks it up and tries to use it on him? You, you remember what happens when they, his opponent tries to use it on him? They always wind up hurting themselves because they have no idea how to use them. It's useless to them. And it, this is what, it, this is what wisdom, God's wisdom is like to those who are not spiritual. It's useless because it's foolishness to them. God's wisdom is accessible to those who walk with God. And as I consider this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and through the rest of 1 Corinthians, I realize, you know, it's a process. God's wisdom doesn't become part of my heart and part of my thinking uh, overnight. It's a process. Paul says in the beginning of the very next chapter, he says, uh, Brothers, when I spoke to you, I could not speak to you as uh, spiritual people because you are still of the flesh and you're acting like people who are of the flesh. In other words, you have not grown in this spiritual wisdom yet. And it's a reflected in all of their actions and the way they treat one another. And so the question should be this. What am I doing to increase in godly wisdom? Am I spending time reading God's word? Am I spending time, as the psalmist said, meditating and reflecting on God's word and what I can learn about God, what I can learn about myself, what I can learn about my engagement with the world around me? Do I spend time considering how this uh, should uh, uh, work itself out in my life? Do I spend time praying to God about what I read? Do I spend time reading this alongside other Christians and gaining God's wisdom together? There is nothing that can replace and take the place of reading God's word together with other people. And that's part of the reason why we have our Bible studies and our Bible classes. That's why before we come together for worship, we have a session where we can read the Bible together. And that's why on Wednesday night over here in the other building in the fellowship hall, we have a, a Bible study around uh, tables where we can have our snacks and coffees and informal time uh, uh, to study God's word. And on Thursday nights, we have men over here and ladies over there. And uh, what am I missing? And on uh, Tuesday mornings, uh, ladies meet together over there as well. And uh, the reason we do that is because we want to engage in considering God's word as a group. There's a way we can... Uh, uh, encourage each other and and rely on the uh, wisdom of God together that that uh, it doesn't take the place of doing so all by myself but we must engage whatever the process is we must engage in the process in order to become profession, proficient in godly wisdom and the problem with the Corinthian church is they were still unspiritual and they were still applying worldly wisdom and that's why Paul says this um, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. In other words, it's foolishness to the world. I'm engaging and taking hold of godly wisdom. So the question for myself should be this. What does godly wisdom tell me about handling questions and issues and problems in my life. And this is going to be uh, the uh, um, lens by which we read the rest of 1 Corinthians. Because we can, when we continue to read uh, the rest of uh, Corinthians, we see the contrast between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. We come to chapter 5, we see the issue of acceptance and tolerance. Worldly wisdom says we're tolerant of all things and we're accepting of all things if there is no harm, even though there's a man living in sin with his father's wife. Godly wisdom says deliver such a one to Satan in order to save his soul. Deliver such, In other words, withdraw from that person so that he would be motivated to repent and make himself right with God and also to prevent sin from spreading in the church. 
The next chapter uh, deals with disputes among brethren. Worldly wisdom says if you can't work it out, that's what our court systems are for. Godly wisdom says don't go to the worldly courts and their worldly wisdom. Work it, work it out among yourselves. Surely there's someone wise among you to be able to work this, uh, work this out among yourselves. And if you can't, then just take the loss and move on. That's godly wisdom. Chapter 7 deals with marriage and divorce. And the worldly wisdom says if you're not fulfilled, then just get divorced and go out and look for somebody else. Godly wisdom says you belong to your spouse and your spouse belongs to you. Don't get divorced. And if you do separate, separate for a time, then come back together. The next uh, couple of chapters deals with freedom and personal rights. Worldly wisdom says you have your rights and no one else is ever going to step on your rights and so you insist on your rights. Godly wisdom, on the other hand, says I am willing to give up my rights to keep my brother from stumbling. Godly wisdom says I will become all things to all men for the sake of the gospel for those who are unconverted. The next chapter in chapter 10 deals with participation. Worldly wisdom says, wherever you go, you need to respect the local customs and the local gods. In fact, that was one of the things Christians were uh, criticized for because they were so stubborn, they didn't respect the local gods when they traveled. But godly wisdom says, don't participate in any kind of idolatry in any form. Instead, flee from it. Chapter 11, men are men, women are women. Chapter 12, everyone is important in the body. Uh, we give more honor to the, uh, to the member that lacks uh, public honor and public acclaim. Chapter 13, the greatest thing of all is love, properly defined. Chapter 14, there is no competition in the body. We focus on edifying one another and not puffing ourselves up. And chapter 15, the thing that is of first importance is the gospel. All rule, all authority, and all the power will be abolished, including the wisdom of the world. So the question should be, what does godly wisdom tell me about handling a question, an issue, or a problem as a Christian? Yes, the cross, the message of the cross is the power of God. The message of the cross is our wisdom. Jesus, you realize this is our, Jesus is our pattern for life. We die to ourselves and we're raised up to walk a new person. And we know what that means when we accept Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. And we know what that means. We go down to the water. He forgives us all of our sins. And we're born again. But have you thought about what that means to be born again? That means who you were is not who you are any longer. You become a new person. And you take on godly wisdom. You no longer think the way the world thinks. You think with godly wisdom. And we call that conversion. Now, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I invite you to do so today. If you accept that he died on the cross for your sins and you accept his lordship over your life, then you're ready to go down into the water and he'll wash away all of your sins and you'll become a child of his and he'll continue uh, to uh, transform you into the goodness and righteousness of God. And the final question, if you've already done that, is this. Which instruction book do I consult for wisdom? Do I consult at all or do I just react? Am I pursuing godly wisdom? And if I'm not sure if I am, then I guess the final question is this. If I'm not, then what am I going to do about it? So I will leave that question hanging in the air as we stand and sing the next song.